Hi, everyone. It's V Spear at the James Beard Foundation coming to you with our favorite day of the week. It's Spirited Conversation, where we'll be talking with two of our friends from, well, three, because we now have Scott as well, which is exciting. Um, as the head of women's programs, I'm not used to seeing men around a lot, so I'm sorry, Scott, that I missed you there, but we're very <laughs> glad that you're here. Uh, we'll be sharing ideas on what's happening in the beverage world, in particular with distilleries um, and uh, where we where we see it going. So as always on Friday, we'd like to get started with a cocktail. So if you don't have a drink, this is your time to get one today. I will be having from Durham Distillery, the Consumption Rosé Spritz. Now, if you live in North Carolina in Raleigh you're able, or Raleigh Durham area, you're able to pick that up. I have saved this as a special treat from our last visit. So thank you to Melissa for this delightful cocktail. Um, outside of that, there are a couple other cool things that are coming up tonight in the weekend to keep you all busy. Tonight, Cherry Bomb is hosting the very first talent show. So if you go on Instagram to at Cherry Bomb, you'll be able to find a link to buy tickets. Tickets, um, you have to buy them by 3 p.m. and the show starts at 8. It'll feature some of your favorite chefs, restaurateurs, and food folks just like apparently sing, dancing, reading from cookbooks, baton twirling I heard might be happening. It's only five bucks, so very well worth it to record that and have that special memory to carry you through the rest of the quarantine. Um, we also want to remind you that today is just a casual conversation between our friends. Um, what's working for Melissa or Scott or Anne where they live may not be legal or work for you where you live, but we wanted to give you a little bit of an insight as to what folks are doing around the country that's making sense for them and also just be able to share a drink together. So again, disclaimer, if they say something, please check your state laws and make sure it's legal for you. Um, and also we want today to be really interactive. So there are a couple ways that you can interact with us during the webinar and Emily is gonna share that with you now. Yes, hi, welcome back everybody. Um, so as always, this webinar is going to be recorded and you can check this one out um, if you missed it or if you wanna revisit anything uh, along with all of our past webinars on some really interesting topics at jamesbeard.org slash industry dash support dash webinars and that's all there. Um, we're going to save questions for the end but if you have something that just pops into your brain as we go along you can just submit it using the questions function and we will feed those through. Uh, and if you're having technical difficulties some sound might be weird your question isn't coming through uh, you can send that to us through the questions function or the chat function and I will help you troubleshoot those. Great thanks Emily. So I want to um, get started with just introducing uh, both groups to, to the uh, attendees here. Uh, maybe Ann and Scott, just start by telling us who you are, where you live, what you do. So we are Highwire Distilling Company. We're in Charleston, South Carolina, and we make uh, whiskeys and gins predominantly. We also make an Amaro and a few other um, limited edition brandies. Um, our philosophy is very uh, rooted in agriculture. We um, contract grow very large quantities of Jimmy Red corn specifically every year and use South Carolina agriculture to fuel uh, most 99% of our products. Nice. Um, and Melissa, just a little bit north here of High Wire Distilling, tell us what you're doing in, in Durham. Absolutely, yeah. So we're Durham Distillery. We're the makers of conniption gins. Uh, my uh, spouse and partner is wandering around today trying to intercede when our boys come back from a bike ride. But uh, so conniption gins are the combination of uh, vapor infusion and vacuum technology. We were the first ones to bring in rotary evaporations uh, for gin in the U.S. Um, and we also do uh, have the canned cocktails, as uh, V, you just showed up there, the rosé spritz, the gin and tonic, and a vodka soda. Uh, and then we have our damn fine line, which is the liqueurs that are in North Carolina only. Which I also oh, have. It's a problem. <laughs> it's a problem. Yeah. And now I am uh, also make hand sanitizer on the side, too. Yes, on the topic of hand sanitizer, which is, I think, one of the craziest things y'all ever had to think you were going to be on the front lines of this disease, fighting it with both cocktails and hand sanitizer, the two things that people want more of now than they've ever wanted before. Um, Melissa, tell me a little bit about how you got in the hand sanitizer business and what's happening. 
Sure. So actually, it was right when we got back from Charleston Food and Wine. So we'd seen the Marshalls that weekend. Uh, we were just talking about how it seems like it was one of the last events before we really had the shelter in place orders start across the country. Uh, but when we got back from Charleston Food and Wine, we were realizing that a lot of our hospitality colleagues were starting to figure out how they could stay open, um, since that was really at, at the standard of time right then. And so we had a disinfectant spray that first we came out with specifically for hospitality, and it was donation only. It was 70% uh, of ethanol and water, so nothing um, to take away from any efficacy. We didn't add in any aloe or glycerin or anything at that time. It was really just a spray form. Um, so we were following EPA guidelines for that at that moment. Um, but it very quickly switched over where uh, we found out that there was so much need for hand sanitizer um, that we worked very closely to figure out where the FDA was going, as well as our we are, distilleries are monitored by the TTB at the federal level. And so looking at that, both of those guidances and figuring out how we could really help our immediate community with hand sanitizer. Um, so right now we have that line is in production for hand sanitizer specifically for the emergency management of North Carolina, um, as well as, uh, so they're the ones that are dispersing among like state troopers and um, other state government um, facilities. And then we have our donation program, which is specifically for uh, police departments, uh, frontline EMS, uh, fire departments, um, and that's the donation side of the house um, that we've been able to keep going as well. Yeah, that is incredible work. And I know Ann and Scott, you guys are working on the hand sanitizer, sanitation stuff as well. You just filled a whole silo with a different kind of corn than you're used to. Tell us a little bit about what's happening for you guys on that front. Well, we, um, Melissa and those guys were on the front edge and, and CNN picked up, uh, I think, some uh, media from that and ran some some national media on and then the floodgates opened and we started getting inquiries like 25 30 a day uh, and we we're not operational yet so we we were, have been you know so it was frustrating because we were like well we don't you know we we just moved into a new facility we also don't have a lot of just alcohol sitting around on hand um, that we can convert to sanitizer so um, we and, and as Melissa mentioned, the TTB and the FDA were sort of working things out around what what exactly we're going to be allowed to make as a distillery. So we have one formula that's allowed. Um, so uh, by the time all that kind of uh, worked its way through the system, we were like, OK, this is a real need because we're continuing to get inquiries. So we thought, what can we do to kind of further that community spirit. So we decided to use local farms. Mm. So we're, we're buying, uh, you know, commodity corn, but from a local uh, farm that's less than 50 miles from here, uh, they were happy to get the business. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna take that and convert it into uh, alcohol and add some glycerin and hydrogen peroxide. But in, that me in the meantime, um, we've also had some local breweries reach out to us. They're they're hurting, uh, mm. especially on their keg beer, um, yeah. but they wanted to get in on the you know the community side of things, and we came up with an idea to with a with a, a fairly large local brewery to convert their beer and uh, do a 100% donation through all the fire stations in town. Mm. So we're set up stations all through the city and open it up to the general public uh, and basically say, you know, bring a spray bottle and we're going to, you know, you can fill it for free one, one per person. You know, you can't bring five gallon jugs or anything <laughs> like that. Uh, try to keep some order, but that's uh, sort of a, a good way we feel like that we can give back. And, you know, we feel like that um, this is going to continue for a while. I mean, in sort of uh, uh, the need, we, we felt guilty you know, because we weren't able to to make it. So we we're excited that we're finally able to to do something and hopefully help out. Yeah, and we're getting a couple of questions about how people can potentially make their own hand sanitizer at home, or if they're a distiller, they're having a hard time getting um, 
getting the raw ingredients to do this. Is this something that we think the ship maybe has sailed on either the paid contracts from the government or the ability to really even get the raw materials to start up at this point? Yeah, absolutely. I think it, what you see with the FDA and the guidance is that um, the distilleries that uh, have already gotten their permits from the federal government from the TTP, so our distilled spirits plants, are the ones that um, underneath the or the emergency order from um, the federal government, those are the ones that are allowed to proceed to um, still register with the FDA and move into this production line. Um, but you you couldn't be new to the the game on it, quite honestly. It really has to be you know existing businesses that and you have to remember this this is very highly volatile stuff, right? This is eighty percent alcohol by volume as as a final product. Um, in mm -hmm. order to meet the uh, WHO and the FDA guidelines for the hand sanitizer. So I mean, there's so much safety concerns that go into handling and packaging um, that level of alcohol uh, mm -hmm. that this this is just from a, these are, the distilleries know how to do that. Yeah. And a lot of folks, even from the distilleries, you know, they're saying that the getting the raw ingredients is difficult. We heard last mm -hmm. week from Monica at 10th Ward that the Navy in Maryland is actually the person who controls all the raw materials and receptacles for the hand sanitizer. And so they release to her only what they need at a time. So I would say, yeah, I mean, it, one of the things we're doing with these webinars is revealing truths and the truth may be the hand sanitizer thing might not be a viable option for folks who are trying to stay relevant, who do have this spent alcohol to use right now. And um, so what I, my next question for you guys is, you know, folks are trying to stay relevant and with uh, the restrictions on their tasting rooms, um, what advice do you have on how you're handling bottle sales or how you're handling curb pickup? Maybe start with uh, Ann and Scott. We have, uh, South Carolina being the very conservative state that it is, um, allowed curbside pickup for breweries but not for distilleries. Um, so we are starting to to chip away at that designation because we feel like curbside service is the safest way to get product into the community. We are doing bottle sales here um, and it's um, it's a slow road. I think um, really the way that we are, are staying relevant is um, using social media to really get our messaging out to remind people we're here to um, give them recipes people are just you know restless at home and probably drinking more than ever and and just reminding them that we're here and we're still working and um trying to keep things pretty easy um you know just really and really the hand sanitizer piece is just you know probably the best example of staying relevant in a time like this where um maybe people aren't particularly looking for a high-end product uh, they just want to keep themselves safe and their families safe so so that's a part of it and also just you know looking out for the communities that we serve first and foremost which are our hometowns and making sure that we are supporting um, our local bartenders and our um, local restaurants as much as possible just in any way possible yeah i mean we we really i think because we had just moved, I mean, it was six months of construction and we were mm -hmm. over budget and took more time than, you know, it was all the normal bureaucracy and stressful. So by the time we got, we were like, after wine and food, we're going to take a vacation. Well, here's our vacation right now. So uh, we <laughs> a forced stay at home. So we, we decided to just say, you know what, the, the, we could get creative and do to go cocktail mixes and bottom, you know, and maybe try to do some promotions or whatever. But we really were were internally concerned about having too many people come in the building and yeah. keeping our folks safe and kind of keeping our family. So we established a no touch uh, mm -hmm. type thing. So when people do come in and get bottles, they have their own bags that we don't have to touch anything. They don't have to touch. I, they can pay. It's cashless and get in get out to be honest it's not uh it's not a great piece of business for us so we decided to sort of step back and say let's just think about the big picture uh ann and scott could step back think about what we need to do as a company big picture use this time to think about where we're going to go we're we're contracted this year for our largest grow out uh that we've ever done so we're, we're looking to grow about a million pounds of uh, our jimmy red this year 
Mm. We're also doing seed security work. So we worked in Mexico this year on that. Uh, we're working with some geneticists and sort of focusing on sort of uh, what where Highwire is going as opposed to how are we going to get through these next few weeks. And in the yeah. meantime, you know, hand sanitizer is hopefully going to pay a few bills and we can do some good and donate some and keep ourselves yeah. I think that's really great advice, Scott, thinking about the fact that, you know, as as this started, people try to find an anchor. They try to say, what can I do today? What can I do today? And now we may be in a place where we think maybe laying down the work today, the work of just putting a bottle out today, just putting, you know, anything on the table today is actually costing more than allowing yourself some time for some big picture thinking. Allow yourself to really go back to visioning and dreaming of what it's going to be like when you reopen and where you want to be and, and setting that up as opposed to trying to just get through this day. But while we're still on the topic of getting through the day, I know, Melissa, you are also doing a lot of bottle distribution, both through the liquor stores, which are just, I mean, they're up like 155, or I think I saw it was like 200% in distribution. Are you seeing bottles of conniption, you know, going more quickly through that channel than previously, or is it steady? You know, we we were flat last month, but I think being flat is a win right now. Yeah. Um, you know, conniption gin is about 40% driven by on-premise. Yeah. Right. Um, so with the bars and the restaurants um, not being a channel, um, it's really about how do we engage with our consumers, um, you know, and really have it be top of mind where they can feel connected to us and connected to the team. Uh, and so we've, we've worked really hard on that. I will say that it's definitely more North Carolina driven than we would like but it's because the ABC stores in the, in the state of North Carolina, as you know, it's a control state, so they manage all of it. Mm -hmm. um, they're open. So we're lucky that we're not in a control state such as Pennsylvania, where those are all closed. Yeah. Um, so at least we're, ours are open. Um, distribution, like the outside of North Carolina, is, is pretty well just, it, uh, it's kind of dead right now, yeah. right? I mean, distributors, they're not having their teams go out. They're not, you know, and and uh, even liquor stores, they're not going to take on the smaller brands in terms of reorders before they're going to take on the bigger brands. And as much as we're seeing the increase, the percentage of those double digit increases, the comfort buying is what's come into play, right? So they're going in and they're buying the well-known big brands right now, um, at least the general consumers are, because that's where, again, they're just, they're very comfortable. It makes them feel yeah. Um, it's a price, um, it's a volume. They're buying, you know, handles right. of Tito's over small pints of a, a craft yep. distillery or something. Yeah, yeah. And I think that will level out. I think the the models where it works, like Drizzly, I know, is, is very popular in New York. And um, there's other types of vehicles like that where it's still interstate, which means that you buy it online, but someone's actually gone and, and filled it from a, a local liquor store and had that delivered. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think one of the the dangers that we're in in terms of the distilleries is that um, all of the 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 regulation across in you know or sorry that's intrastate interstate would mean that I could ship out anywhere, right? That right. would be my ideal scenario: is I could go ahead and, and ship you a couple of bottles of conniption, you bought them online. Um, I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that's where you're really starting to see the small businesses, the small craft distilleries. There's not much, there's not much room to grow or even stay flat right now. We're all just right. still trying to, you know, keep the lights on in a lot of ways and, and keep, keep the people employed because this is such a trained workforce. These people uh, are so very important to our success. I mean, our, like, like uh, Ann and Scott were just saying, I mean, our production team, this is part of the reason we're doing hand sanitizers, so we can keep them busy. Right. Um, I don't want to furlough. I had to furlough all front of house and our brand ambassadors. I don't want to have to of furlough course. our production team. Yeah, of um, course. And, you know, and, and as soon as the lights kind of turn back on in terms of the, the distribution channels, you know, you want to have some inventory to fulfill it. Yeah, so of it's, course. It's this, this hard balancing act that we're all in right now. And that's one of the questions that we're getting coming in now is, um, 
you know, folks are considering, they have never done online sales. And, you know, you, so you just see, I've got a lot of sponsored ads to buy wine, three for 50 bucks, right? And so folks are at home and they're like, maybe that's something I should do for my business. But what you guys are saying is that may be a, that may not be an avenue, especially with the way trucking and distribution is happening right now. It's, it's just not possible, right? It's legal. Yeah. It's it's legal. Legal. The legal side of it too. Yeah. When prohibition ended, they essentially sent it back to every state to decide how they were going to deal with alcohol. And one of the side effects of that is that every state gets to decide how and if they receive alcohol. And so if we, the laws of South Carolina do not allow us to ship to begin with, but if we were able to, we could not ship to many states at all. And in mm. fact, we have shipped product to different advisory board members of ours, and we often get threatened with felonies and misdemeanors. Um, wow. From FedEx will rat us out to the authorities, and the state of Virginia is probably the worst at this point. I think they've slapped us on the hand about three times now. But, um, and then, you know, there's there are stores throughout the country that have somehow threaded a needle with shipping to many states, but the average retailer that does ship can only ship to about 12 states in the country. Yeah, yeah so I mean, maybe not the best avenue. I will say that one thing that has come to light, I've, we talk with a lot of, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm the president of our state guild uh, for distillers in South Carolina. And so we've had a lot of interaction with uh, the state house folks and basically where 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 they're reaching out to us and going how are you guys doing and i said this is pretty horrible uh the, the laws are or not we, we don't have parity with the breweries and um we need parity to be able to survive we're very limited i know north carolina used to be worse i think they've gotten a little bit better than than where they used to be uh but it's still not what the breweries have. Exactly. And, and so what this has done, the, the silver lining, I feel like, has opened their eyes to say, wow, we need to help you guys out and change some laws because things really aren't fair, are they? And yeah. um, no. So I got a, a text from a senator yesterday and said, this, I, I'm getting reelected. Next term, we're going to get you some law changes in this state. I'm also on the legislative committee on the national level on the American Craft Spirits Association, and we this hand sanitizer piece was um, something that uh, I was working on in the background to get some of the the language changed for the TTB, so we're not having to pay federal excise tax on that mm -hmm. alcohol we're putting into hand sanitizer. Originally, when Melissa was doing that, she was paying taxes on that alcohol she was donating, right? right? Wow. Yeah. So that kind of stinks, you know. Uh, so um, I think what this this is going to do is really open up the opportunity to have a candid conversation and say we're small businesses. We didn't get the bailouts that we needed. Maybe what we need is a chance to be able to do some business. Yeah. Speaking That's of doing all. business, we um, had a call yesterday where we were actually talking about the seafood markets and some of the things that they were doing to be successful. And a lot of them, local fishermen, were partnering with a local restaurant, a local brewery or distillery or, or liquor store. And they were putting together these packages that I thought was so interesting. I was wondering if this is happening on your side where someone is saying, okay, uh, buy into this package. And what you'll get is, a, let's say, for example, Melissa, you and Ashley Christensen partner, right? And you get a Beasley's chicken to go meal and you get a couple cans of this and uh, you get, you know, something else. And then they create a Zoom call. Most of this is happening through the restaurant. And then you're in the restaurant with other diners who have the same meal they picked up from the same place with the same drinks. And there's some sort of like little host to it. Have you heard of these sort of like online dinner party partnerships happening in your towns? Well, so, I would I would love for that to be legal for us to participate. Not legal. Oh no. Not legal. Not, the rules are fast so, and loose in Maine, man. I know you. So a great example would be uh, Kingfisher in downtown Durham. Um, Sean and Michelle uh, just came out with their B Durham cocktail kits, which mm -hmm. Connecticut Navy Strength is in. And I, I'm like, that's fantastic. I will help promote it for you to to our consumers, but. Uh, the only way for me to do it is if I would donate the alcohol. And even then, it's 
not it's, really. You know, it's just a, such a slippery slope. So it's like, yeah. you know, nope. I would love that. And I think I think there are other states that are allowing curbside cocktails. Yes. Um, so if you're, you're in New York, the two southern states that are not. <laughs> So for those of you who are listening, if you're in New York, Maryland, New Jersey, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Maine, pretty much anywhere north of the Mason-Dixon, go ahead and figure out if it's legal in your in your county to partner with a local restaurant to do a sort of pickup cocktail, pickup meal, Zoom thing, because it's worked out really well for those folks, but maybe I'm north jealous. of the Mason-Dixon. Yeah, I mean, it's great awesome. ingenuity. Thank you. And, uh, I think Florida's doing it. Florida's yep. probably doing it. Florida. Florida's, doing it. Florida's, doing it. Florida's got it going on. Kimball, Kimball, House, Kimball House is putting these little cocktails together and it's really amazing. You can go there and pick up your food and get some yeah. co go cocktails. I'm like, that's so awesome. That's great. Uh, yeah, not legal here. No. Nope. Yeah. Well, that, <laughs> strike that question. We're going to get to that making a cocktail. <laughs> we'll rub it in, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, turning to how you guys are supporting your local economies, and I know that Anne, you mentioned, and Scott, that you guys are buying corn from within 50 miles, and you all are predominantly the buyers of the Jimmy Red corn for the other products that you have. In the case where now maybe you're not able to buy as much Jimmy Red corn, or folks, you know, who really propped up um, a particular niche market, now mostly we're seeing this in restaurant sector, like Dan Barber has special pigs. Those pigs don't have a restaurant to be on. Are you seeing any sort of trouble with your local purveyors who you were the predominant sponsor for not being able to keep up also? We're in a pretty unique position in that we are the main by extension growers of Jimmy Red Corn. So Jimmy Red Corn that is grown for us is not sold anywhere else. Um, so we, you know, and there's one harvest a year. It's not like an ongoing, like a produce company or something like that. Right. That's picking different vegetables throughout the season. So we harvest in August and our farmers uh, store that corn for us and await um, us to draw it from their warehouses. And we were already on a pause because of the building. So we had sort of set up a, a system that, you know, gave the farmer some, um, you know, confidence that we were coming back to get it. So we had, we had prepared for this without knowing we were preparing for this. Um, but we have um, we have reached out to all of our farmers and um, and they have been extremely kind to us. Many of them are also row croppers on the other side, so they still have some flow of products. Sorry about Take that. Take that call, Ann. That could be big business coming in. We can't. <laughs> oh, somebody with some hand sanitizer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Also, while they're figuring that out, I want to remind people we're getting a lot of really great questions, but please also at the end of this webinar, we're going to play a little game with the distillers called What's in Your Fridge and Can I Drink It? And so last week we had a lot of really great cocktails that came out of it. So please post in the question function or chat to Emily what you have in your fridge and they're going to tell you how you make a, a cocktail out of it. Last week we had chickpeas, pickles, and hot dogs. Like we had a lot of things going on and we were able to figure it out. So Chat to us what's in your fridge. Don't throw hot dogs at us, please. <laughs> <laughs> hot dogs from last week. That's old news. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we 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 that week the the week of the 16th when this really hit hard, we had we kind of had a momentary freak out of like because the farmers were like, we need seed because we supply seed to them, and we were like, do we really want to plan on this? We want to be on so we just had very candid conversations with them and said, look, this is, if the world continues to fall apart for whoever knows how long, we just need to all be very, you know, aware of how, how we're going into this. And, uh, but if things sort of roll out and, you know, we will see, it's going to be a crawl back to life is the way I see it. I don't think yeah. it's going to flip of the switch. Um, we just need and to And that was kind of our way of, of having faith in the future and just saying, yeah. you know, we literally had to make a decision on Monday the 16th. We were walking into a meeting with other local food and beverage owners. Um, and we knew that we were all gonna collectively decide to shut down with or without a government order. So we were on the phone. We had just signed on four new farms um, a little bit inland 
because you know uh, last year our biggest enemy was climate change and storms and hurricanes and various um, flooding that we were getting here so we moved a lot of our farm infrastructure about 60 miles inland and we were getting all those farms online in early March so March 16th we made the call to go ahead and supply those farms with seed and just have faith that we were going to be able to work it out on the back end and and those guys are all um, extremely understanding of the situation. They have bought into our program 100%. They're all very proud to be growing for us and okay. and have a bottle of something um, at the end of the year that will have their farm's name on it. And um, and so it's been it, it's sort of kept us uh, going a little bit, just knowing that that there's you know and you know the whole the fact that this all went down in the spring and and everything's like green and and they've been sending us pictures of them planting and the the sprouts coming up and uh, it's just been you know it's just that you know your heart sinks and and you have a lot of hope at the same time so it's just, just gut wrenching uh, you know emotional roller coaster that we're all on of you know we hope we're gonna be able to do something with this and if not there's gonna be some really old jimmy red bourbon that's probably gonna be excellent <laughs> and way older yeah than <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. For it i mean be. that's the beauty is we put it in a barrel it sits i mean it's not i mean you it's know good it's forever. Just, yeah. not going anywhere and melissa with you i know um North Carolina is so vocal for their hospitality workers and for the folks um, that are out of work down there. You know, Ashley's got her own things going on. The Lee Foundation is actually going to be popping up in the next week. Spoiler alert, you heard it here first. <laughs> they are, um, they identified Colleen Speaks to be the new kitchen leader for their hospitality, um, feeding hospitality workers initiative, which is going to be incredible. How, how are you playing into that kind of community work? Like, how, tell me some, we want to hear some beautiful stories about people coming together and making, and making. I know. Things I, and I, I think it's, it's, we're all still a work in progress, right? It's, it's that day to day. What can you do to help your community? I mean, two days ago, for instance, there's a, there's a restaurant that had to be shut down, but they decided that they were going to host Durham free lunch. Um, and they were going to do that. Um, they're going to serve a hundred meals a day, uh, lunches a day, and it's to go wrappers, curbside pickup. And um, my team and I, because we were bottling that day, we'd walked over um, just to, to try and support another establishment that was across the street that was still open. And two little kids ran up to try and get their sandwiches and they'd already sold out. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, you know, we watched it happen and we we're like, OK. And then I immediately went back to the distillery and donated to that fund because I was like that, yeah. that you know, it's just how do, how do you keep looking out for the ones that are helping and how do you support the helpers? Um, and so that's what we're really trying to do. I mean, I, I think so much of, it, of us to date, to your point of trying to take the, you know, the hospitality industry, realizing that this is happening a lot longer than any of us want. And starting to see the organization happen around it. At first it was about legislative. How do we get federal government right. and state governments to realize that, you know, uh, one stimulus package is not nearly enough. Right. Um, and and Obviously, I, as it ran out now. <laughs> right. And, um, and, you know, just in a complete tangent, we couldn't even qualify for the PPP because we had taken institutional investment. And it's a Jeez. tiny amount of institutional investment, but because of the way that they'd structured that program, you couldn't you couldn't even apply. So I, and those are things like that. And I know that you've got a lot of restaurants and bar owners that came up against the same thing. And so yeah. it's, it's sort of like, how do we how do we move forward so that it's top down that we're still getting support and then we also can do the good work that we all want to do in our own communities so you know i think we'll continuously hope to support people especially like ashley and i know chidi has been on the front lines of, yeah. of the lobbying effort um yeah it's it's just <laughs> one day at a time of where is the need great and how can we help right it's yeah so us, I mean, everybody knows where they're at right now in their own cities and states and how this has affected them. Where do you guys, what are you guys doing to think now about the future? Like, what does reopening look like for you? I think um, we, based on 
various sectors. We're distributed in, in 15 states. Um, and the temperature right now, as we feel it, is that we're going to take about a two, three year backslide in our sales. And I think our plan is to just really uh, come out of this swinging in South Carolina and and sort of regrow our distribution map um, the way that we grew it from the beginning, which was starting out in our own community and digging in deep here um, and in the Southeast and then retrenching in our key markets like New York and DC um, and really focusing on places where we have the most brand recognition currently. Um, it, it is, going to be difficult with so much uncertainty around on-premise sales and bars and restaurants and what that model is going to look like and i think everybody from the high wire and durham distillers of the world all the way up to diageo is going to just have to rethink how we all do business and um and that's going to be i think a little easier for smaller companies and for big companies um i think you know, their budgets are so big, um, it's gonna be a little difficult for them to pivot, um, but you know, they are better positioned than we are financially, so that's definitely a plus. But you know, hopefully people uh, will see closures and understand that they need to protect their local economies a little bit more. I think that that is something that will be a highlight and, and just, or a silver lining rather. Um, wow. I mean, I think for us internally, for our tasting room, we don't really care what the government says uh, <laughs> about uh, what they will allow us to do opening wise. I mean, like if they say, you can just throw the doors open and do business like you were, we're not gonna do that. Um, no. We can't do that, not, you know, so we're thinking about, it's gonna be a, a multi-stage, you know, kind of rollout. We talked the other day, we would love it personally, even though it, it's going to hurt, we would love it if they would just keep us closed until August or September, whatever, you know, what, I mean, it, it's hard to say that, but it really, I don't want to do this over again. I don't right. want to open up and then shut down. We live in a hurricane city. Uh, worst thing we could do is open next month and then it flares back up and then we have to shut down in a hurricane and we're we're stuck and we get hit by a you know it's like double disaster uh yeah. it just is unnecessary i would just rather um try to example uh with what we're doing a lot of the restaurants and bars that we met with before this i think are going to be on the same path um i think that our mayor uh and city council listened to that uh yeah. so charleston itself may be under its own little set of rules that the rest of the state isn't you know if they want to go be idiots you know so <laughs> uh, but uh yeah. Yeah. and we're seeing that we're seeing that response honestly from a lot of the restaurant community is such a community of care and they they too don't want to open put themselves in trouble put their diners in trouble open themselves to a lawsuit if somebody gets sick or dies because they came and got contaminated like food poison or anything else that can happen to you that you know we all try to keep a good watch on and they just want it to be done but done correctly and thoroughly you know in a place where we can reopen but melissa what's reopening look like for you because i know when we were down there you're getting ready to open that basement lounge and everything there was there was stuff happening oh it's it's heartbreaking right so our general manager we recruited her from richmond virginia she's phenomenal um you know she's uh done some sommelier training but she's also just but she's just a great cocktail artist to yeah. put it. Uh, and so Christelle moved here three weeks before shelter in place. And so she's in a, a new apartment. Thankfully, she has a lot of people that she'd already known in the bar community here. But, you know, I, I, I have no opening timeline for yeah. a whole new on premise gin lounge that Right. You know, it, it's gorgeous down there. I almost was going to do the webinar from there so you guys could see it. I mean, it's it's essentially ready. Yes. And patio work, you know, because we'd already contracted for it. That's all done. That, that got done this week. And mm -hmm. so now you're like really looking at this amount of investment from a money perspective, but also from a, a brand. We want we want our mm -hmm. 
we want our consumers to come in there and have a martini cart experience and yeah. it's just like everything's on pause and so we're trying to move a lot of that to online and so mm -hmm. christelle is now doing every uh sunday through thursday um and actually they're doing it today too uh they're, they're doing a 5 30 instagram lives on okay, corpse what's your survivor. Instagram handle? Is it this one yeah, here? Or on this the, the Corpse Survivor uh, cocktail bar one. So, um, but I, I think that's exactly what it is. <laughs> if it's not, I'm gonna go look at my phone quickly, uh, or you okay. can go, you can see it from Conniption Gin. Uh, okay. But anyway, so she is, she's really like trying to just bring these cocktails to life on Instagram so that people can, can really uh, feel like they're up at a bar and that I they're know. gonna learn tricks of the trade before uh, we open. So I have no idea. I really don't. Yeah. I mean, I think we're very lucky that we're continuing gin production at the same time. <clears throat> we're doing hand sanitizer. The tasting room's closed. I mean, our tasting room's not very big. You've been in there. It's not, yep. we're not, I, I mean, I don't think that that's going to be a tasting bar and I don't think we're going to do behind the scenes tours. I, that's I just what I was uh, wondering. How will this affect the future of tasting, you know, behind the scenes tours of, are you going to let people back there potentially risk contaminating, you know, a whole barrel of something that's maybe off the table for folks now, huh? Yeah, I, I think it goes back to, you want your team to be safe. You want your consumers to be safe, but I, I'm not worried about the, I mean, the equipment and everything that we've got is, is we obviously we know how to, to clean really well right. as distillers, but it's just, yeah, it's, we have to keep everyone safe. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, for y'all. I mean, for us, uh, you know, like I say earlier, the 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 big picture piece. I mean, we've been spending more and more energy and time on becoming better stewards for the agriculture. You know, I think that just finding uh, uh, something like uh, a Jimmy Red and just saying we grow it and whatever. We throw it in the ground and then we make whiskey with it. We decided to, to, to go farther and farther back on those genetics and have really been digging in and uh, thinking about our growing practices and thinking about how we deal with the farms. We pay eight to 10 times commodity price to these guys. That's why they're enticed to, to do this. And they feel really, I think they feel better about a future with us than they do on the other side. Um, yeah. So. I think that, you know, we just need to stay the course uh, yeah. on the picture. And the little stuff, it just is going to kind of have to take a break right now because we talked about, like I say, we saw other distilleries doing uh, delis of a cocktail mix and a bottle come in. By, but that's just a lot of people coming in and out of the door. And it felt like, is that really yeah. worth it? You know, right. I mean, what are we talking? Maybe $1,000 a week, maybe? and at the end of the day, how are we going to feel about that if, you know, if we're helping spread this thing even more? So we just, yeah. we just decided, like I say, so I think as we go, it's just going to be easing the door open. We've got a brand new facility as well. It's, mm -hmm. it's well, I don't know. With a giant event space right next door. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it sounds it, like a lot of storytelling changes, you know, what maybe we were able to do by bringing people in the back to show them how the, the spirit was made is now going to be keeping them in the front and then telling them how the corn is growing or showing them something, something else. Yeah. yeah we, we do have, uh, to close out here, a lot of ingredients for you guys to play. <laughs> what can you make with? Good luck with this, yeah. Y'all ready for this? Full disclosure, we're not really We're great. not bartenders. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. All right. I also do have a cocktail that I'm going to make, too, so. Yes. Oh, right. Melissa, make your cocktail for us, and then we'll go into what's in your fridge. Show us what you're making. So, Lee tried to line it up here a little bit. What a so, good man. Everyone's starting to think about their gardens, right? Because we all love to... To think about well now that i have to grow some stuff at home what do i have handy so i was thinking um who knows a a gin mojito the yeah. south side okay so it's south side but then let's marry it to a french 75 which means i'm going to make it with bubbles mm. in their life, right? all right so i've got some mint leaves that were yeah. uh, 
nice and fresh in our garden. So I'm just going to put two in. Doesn't matter what they look like now, right? Because you're going to muddle it. Add and one. ain't coming over anyway, so you can't, you know, no one can judge you. <laughs> it's going to taste great. It's going to taste good. All right, so we're going to have some lime. So I'm just going to take half of a lime because this is yep. just for me. Look at that fancy gadget. I know, look at that. You're professional. Okay. So we just have juice of half of a lime. I've got two lime leaves in there. No. I've got one uh, small ice cube. And Dig it. Go ahead and mush that a little bit. That's why I took one of the wet ice. So wet yeah. ice means that it's just sat there a little bit longer so you can actually pound on it. It's not fresh out of the freezer. Okay. Where's my simple syrup? Oh yeah, see, Lee did this for me. Lee, Lee is right? good. I know he is. Get you a uh, man like Lee. Yeah. So I'm going to do a quarter ounce because I don't want this very sweet because we've got the kava. Yeah. And then this is the key ingredient for me, got right? It. Yes. So this is um, Conniption American Dry is the contemporary, which means that it's not going to be like looking at pine tree. Juniper is in balance. And this is Friday afternoon. We're doing the full. Yes. Um, Emily has a bottle of your Navy strength gin on her desk for the bad days. <laughs> or the good days, really, you know, Tuesday. I should have done this a little bit because I want this to really chill fast. So we're going to do that while that's doing it. And then we're going to shake. Because why not? Yeah. <laughs> like a regular Tom Cruise. Yeah. Cocktail dreams. Everybody's got their own hey, style. Do yeah. you like it? Yeah. <laughs> shake, shake. We got the, the fancy conniption one, too. All right. I, I personally enjoyed the pop the top and pour it version of your cocktail. <laughs> Everybody's drinking Melissa's drinks today. Stop and pour it. Okay, so first we're just gonna go ahead and strain it into the chilled, slightly chilled. Ooh, freshy. And instead of seltzer, which is what you would do, right, if you wanna add just a little bit of bubbles to a mojito or south side, kava. So Use it up. Why not? Okay. I love great. that. Pour that on, and then we need a little bit more mint. Of course. Fast. Ooh, that mint must have been fresh. We're gonna bring it closer. <laughs> Yay! Woo! Beautiful. All right, how's, it taste? how's it taste? Give us the tasting notes. I'm ready. That'll do. Yep. Beautiful. Thank you, Melissa. Huh? Thank you. Oh, of course. <laughs> because you so made us I, a cocktail. I have no idea if have hot dogs or bratwurst or mustard. Oh, it's going to get worse than that. You don't even know. These people oh, have no. crazy stuff in their fridge. Okay, so. We, we, we've we, got, we've got a cocktail right here. Oh, you have a cocktail too? Yes. Okay. So here's mine. So we just take this dry whiskey <laughs> and then you pour it in this glass and then drink. Perfect. I mean, I'm I could have done that with a kiss and pass. Just kiss it to your lips and pass it on to your friend. We're, we're not, we're not, we're not, we, I know how to make a great Negroni. Uh, yeah. I've, learned, I've, I've mastered the skill of a Negroni uh, and it, it is a lot of technique, uh, but. Um, oh, for sure. I think <laughs> we'll have a Negroni. Gin and tonic, I love bitters. I'm a bitters fan. I love, I think bitters make cocktails so much better. And then Ann makes a great Manhattan. And then we, I don't know. We 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 cheat and use you know ready to kind of some mix some mixers sometimes ready to. I mean I've had Anne's cocktails and I remember like the first couple sips and then I just remember having a good time. I don't know what happens after that or what the hell she put in it, but it is a delightful time. It is karaoke in the hotel lobby. It is it is a wonderful. It is new All best right. friends. It is I'll go out with you. I want to go out with you, oh. man. Yeah, let's as soon do as we go out. Oh, it's not me we're going out with. I'm boring. It's <laughs> Ann and Scott that you want to go out with. <laughs> I'm like fun That's adjacent. Like it's like fun's here and then I get invited over here. <laughs> All right, let's play what's in your fridge. We've only got a couple minutes left and we got so many good ingredients. I think people are going to really love it. Okay, the first one 
from a member of the Women's Advisory Council, Ms. Allison Cook. We're very excited to have her offering up yellow miso, chocolate, tahini, and pepperoncini. Yellow miso, chocolate tahini, that's one thing, and pepperoncinis. <laughs> You don't have to use them all. Just just think about any one of those you might use. Uh, yellow miso is a paste, I'm assuming, not a powder. Yeah, I so. Yep. I would probably do a version of a gin sake martini with the Ooh. yellow miso. Yeah. So if you have a little bit of sake. Um, some gin, I would go more towards a London dry, something with a lot of like juniper, big mm -hmm. and bold. They've got the navy strength of conniption. That would be definitely the one I would go with. Um, yes. So you'd probably just put the miso in there when you're in your shaker, not a lot, like just a I need. little bit to add, yeah, add that little bit to it. And then, um, then it would have uh, some citrus element. You could probably do lemon or lime. Okay. Uh, and then a little bit of simple. You shake that just like we just did, and then you you top it um, with the sake. Nice. Yeah. That's what Snaps I would do. Snaps for Melissa. That was an elevated <laughs> cocktail for a Friday. <laughs> All right, Ann and Scott, what do you think? <laughs> Chocolate tahini and pepperoncinis. Did you guys come up with anything? I think, I think for the pepperoncinis, I would make sort of a riff on a dirty martini, maybe. You know. Ooh. And. Uh, you know, just nice and cold, get it nice and uh, cold, shaken, not stirred. Mm -hmm. uh, and not so sure. <laughs> pour it up and then, you know, just a, a, a garnish of the, the pepperoncini itself. Keep it simple. Like Maybe a lemon in there. Lemon. You know, le lemon, would that be good? Yeah, you know what people have been asking also is they've wow. got the components for a lot of different cocktails, but some of them are missing an acid. Is there something you could use instead? Mm -hmm. Like if you don't have lemons, limes, or oranges in your house, what could you use as an acid? Well, I mean, like there is a, a restaurant in town that does, he, where I was going with this is he makes a, uh, a, a dirty martini with pickled green tomatoes, so it's vinegar. Oh, you know, so I mean, any, there is yeah. there is ability to do sort of a. I mean, I think you like cheat a little bit. You don't want to go overboard with that, but I think you know ultimately it is pickleback. Yeah, like a pick, <laughs> like a, Yeah, I mean it is it 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 does work. Uh, but you know you have to probably, uh, you know, balance it with a little sweet. sweet you don't want to sure. Well, Emily uh, has weighed in here, the wonderful Emily Roth Krug, our program manager, with a chocolate tahini espresso martini, which could be delicious. Mm -hmm. I, so that. I like that. All right. Next ingredient, we have canned pumpkin, pickled Ooh. beets, <laughs> and yeah. green chilies. You don't have pickled to use them all in the same. That's just what they were referencing. They said they have canned pumpkin, like chopped green chilies in a can, and canned pickled beets. Can use just one of those ingredients. Pickled beets, I would go back to the martini. Yeah. I think that would be fun. There are a lot of people in the South that use pot liquor for martinis too. Pot yeah. liquor, ice cubes in cocktails. Um, I mean, green chilies, quite honestly, I'd make a spicy margarita. Yes, Melissa. For sure. Yeah. I love and that. Anything yeah. with green chili. Yeah. What do you think? Just muddle it in there with some tequila and some lime and I'd probably blend it. Blend it? Okay. I would probably. Yeah. I mean, because you don't really want <laughs> chunks, chunks of green chili. <laughs> That's why we're asking you. I mean, I'd probably blend the green chilies with a little bit of uh of uh sugar first, just to get them all mushed and then sure. then build your margarita mm -hmm. from there. This is a good one. Are you guys ready for this? I have two real stingers and that's how we're going to have to close out. Are you ready? All right. The easier of the stinger. Mac and cheese powder. Just the powder from the Kraft mac and cheese box. Mm. Mm. Throw it out and get some whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> make mac and cheese, put whiskey with it. <laughs> Could you right. use a slutty Mary glass with oh 
mac and cheese powder. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah oh, Bloody Mary with deep. a little rim of that. Yeah, that's kind of a good idea. I feel that. All right, here's the last like one. Pepper martini with the peppers and then you rim it with that cheddar, like peppered, you know, cheese. We call it like a Dorito cheese. All, right. All right, Scott, you try that tonight. Hey, Let us know how it goes. <laughs> It'll be a, it's that's, we're going to call that the bro teeny. It tastes like a Dorito. <laughs> you made it with shit you found around. It's fine. The bro teeny. Mix in there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The last thing, and I need to know, Jennifer, where you're writing in from. Jennifer, where you're writing in from. Are you ready? Muskrat. Muskrat season ended and we had to cancel our muskrat tastings and pairings. So I have a lot of thawing and frozen muskrat. Now I'm from Connecticut. I don't know what that is. Like we, north of the Mason Dixon, we, we, we don't muskrat. I don't know what muskrat is. So. This is the song. I've never eaten muskrat. muskrat. She's from Maryland. This is a Maryland thing. Okay, muskrat. I was about to say, that doesn't sound like anything that what I've do, ever heard of. What does muskrat taste like? Yeah. Is it What's like, it taste like, Jen? Is it like chicken? Uh, it tastes like duck. It tastes like duck. Duck. Okay. Oh, well, instead, then I, I probably would use it as, add, I wouldn't make a cocktail. I would figure out a braising liquid. Mm. I, I, you know, I, I mean, obviously, I'm going to lean more towards gin just because it's my wheelhouse, but I'd probably do a braising liquid that has sort of like, you know, a really big bowl of gin, peppercorns, you know, some yeah, sort of fat. Like Hmm? What cocktail pairs with that, maybe? Maybe you cook the muskrat, but then what would you drink with something like a duck, like a really rich? Whiskey. Whiskey. <laughs> Again, Scott throws the ingredient <laughs> out, whiskey on the rocks. <laughs> do they have uh, like plum wine or anything? I would do something that has like a plum wine accent oh. with, with a whiskey. I love um, that, like the Habiki 12 years and the plum wine yeah. bill. Those are yeah, great. great. Yeah. That, yeah, that really, that really great. Because uh, a lot of times in with duck, you've got plum or fig. Yeah. You finish some whiskey yeah. in Madeira barrels, and that would be really good with with yeah. some. Yeah. But that that four or to five. Port. Yeah, kind of four. Right. Yeah. Would Fully nice. last question: What can you can you do anything with dried herbs? Like if people have dried sage or dried oregano, they don't have fresh herbs. Is there anything you can do with the dried thyme, dried herbs? I mean, I think you can macerate any of those things. I mean, if you you know you have some just neutral alcohol, vodka or Everclear or something, you can macerate herbs. I mean, we do stuff all the time. Uh, we forage around town. We'll grab, like right now, loquats are in season down here. So we went down and picked a bunch of loquats off a tree and we take the seeds and drop those in some alcohol and let them macerate. I've taken some tea olive flowers uh, so I think same kind of thing, any herbs you could make, uh, bitters, you know, you could try your hand at making some bitters if you, you know, I mean, to be honest, if you have a, uh, something that you really love, like if you were way into thyme or oregano or something, nothing to say that you can't play around and, and, and at home and make your own bitters. Brad Parsons, I don't know if you know, uh, writer, he wrote a book called Bitters. There's a lot yeah. of recipes in there and i'm sure online there are hundreds thousands of recipes for bitters but i think herbs definitely would and then you could do some funky amaro or amari you know uh maybe i mean while you got time at home i mean it's uh <laughs> i mean i think Great that's also where everyone. i probably head into like teas i think teas. one of the, the great trends is kind of was really starting to to take hold was you know sort of the the tea infusion um uh, for cocktails. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, yeah, everybody's kind of has Earl Grey or, you know, <laughs> maybe not sleepy time tea, but something like hanging around. Tea. Tea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so much for being here. We are at time. I feel like we could do this forever. And Ashley Parker, or Ashley P, not Parker, Ashley wrote in back to the muskrat thing, had a great idea here. It'd be good with a fat washed whiskey and a Cabernet, like an orange peel or cranberry reduction. I so like thank it. you for that, Ashley. I like it. I'm here for it. Audience participation. We're learning all the things. Great.
Um, so again, thank you, Anne, Scott, and Melissa for being with us, for sharing what's going on in the world of beverage and how folks can get involved, um, just generally sharing these wacky recipes with us and raising a glass. You guys can learn more about what is going on in the world of food and hospitality here at jamesbeard.org slash relief. We also have uh, listed there, you'll be able to find the industry support webinars. Next week, we have an incredible lineup coming out if you haven't seen. We have Culinary Cannabis with Rachel Birkins and the ACF. We have Kat Kinsman and Steph and Jamila coming to talk about the state of food journalism right now and lots more people for you to check out. So go on jamesbeard.org slash relief. You'll also find the Chef Advocacy Toolkit there. So if you wanna get the laws changed in your state, if you see something that you think another state is doing well, this toolkit should help you find who your representative is and how best to get in contact with them. As always, we hope that you have a nice weekend. We hope you stay safe and take care of yourself. And thank you again, Scott, Anne, and Melissa for being with us today. We'll see you all next thank week. You. Bye. Take care. Cheers. <laughs>